Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium, and of course to welcome those who join us on each occasion on our Heritage.org website. Uh, we would ask everyone in-house to make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off. And for those on the Internet, we, of course, will accept your comments or questions throughout the presentation, simply emailing us at heritage, uh, speaker at heritage.org. And we will post this program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference. Hosting our discussion this morning is <laughs> William Beach. Bill Beach is director of our Center for Data Analysis at Heritage. He is our chief number cruncher. He oversees original statistic research on taxes, social security, crime, education, trade, and other major issues. Prior to joining Heritage, he has served as a litigation economist. He was also economist for the state of Missouri. And then he moved to Washington to be president of the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University before joining us over 10 years ago. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Bill Beach. Bill? Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. And a hearty welcome to all of you to the Heritage Foundation for this important uh, two-session event that we're holding today. The dollar, the euro, and the international monetary order. What is the United States to do? Here's the world recovering from an enormous recession. I wrote a friend of mine last, last night in Europe, and I said, I hope we meet again before the next global recession. Um, it, it's, it's a period of uncertainty. It's a period of policy change. It's a period in which we see people striking out in new directions, but also in directions which have been taken time and time again, and one worries about that. In fact, in thinking about this uh, session, Harris Segermark and I and others who are involved, J.D. Foster, here at the Foundation, we, we couldn't think of a better time in our uh, uh, policy moment, if, if you will, to revive a discussion of that fruitful policy mix which has done so much to bring so much prosperity all over the world. What a great time to think about what is the role of free trade? How much can we lift the burden off of the shoulders of businesses and households and individuals of taxation and regulation? How can we attain a stable, solid monetary framework, both within the United States but particularly worldwide, that will bring the fruits of those other two parts of the policy mix to bear on economic output? We are in a period of enormous change. We're wrapped up in it. We don't see it, but it's right there. You can just, every time you come out of a great recession, you have a great moment for making great mistakes <laughs> or run the right moves. And again, Howard, J.D. Foster and I were thinking, Terry Miller, uh, what, a, what a rotten time for these decisions to have to be made in Washington. Because uh, we have so many good serving members of Congress who have never had to think about the international financial order or think about monetary policy and as it crosses the, the lake and it crosses the borders. How does that work? So this is the beginning of hopefully an educational frontal assault on that ignorance with uh, a wonderful panel to start the day and to ponder this question of the monetary order and what is the United States to do with Steve Hankey and Judy Shelton, followed after a break by a keynote address by Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Mundell. So I'm going to turn the podium over in just a moment to Steve Hankey, followed by Judy Shelton. But prior to doing that, I'd like to introduce both of, of these uh, astounding individuals to you if you don't already know them. Uh, if you don't already know them, you may not know also that with the addition of Robert Mundell, you have the all-star batting champions of monetary policy in the auditorium this morning. Steve Hankey. Professor Hankey is uh, a professor of applied economics and co-director of the Institute for Applied Economics and the Study of Business Enterprise at Johns Hopkins University uh, just up the road. Uh, uh, Steve has advised so many governments. I could sit here and list them all morning long, I think. We had dinner last night with one of his clients the government uh, of uh, Montenegro, right? 
and uh, it was it was interesting to hear that conversation. Uh, particularly well known for currency boards, uh, particularly active in the early 1990s, late ni 1980s in that whole area. In fact, he's done so much that in 1998 he was one named one of the 25 most influential people by World Trade Magazine. You, you have read his columns in Forbes and many other publications. And his most recent book is on Zimbabwe, Hyperinflation to Growth, which is, gives us a hopeful view of that future. He will be followed by a very good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Judy Shelton. Uh, Judy has been in so many leadership positions over the past uh, several years that it uh, would take a long time to name them all. But one of my favorite connections with Judy is through Jack Kemp, uh, who did so much for that one leg of the policy mix, the whole notion of pro-growth tax cuts and tax relief, uh, where she served uh, as a staff economist, a senior economist with uh, Kemp's National Commission on Economic Growth and Tax Reform. 1995 to 1996, where our own Dr. Fulner was a co-chair of that, of that effort. Uh, she's testified uh, before all of the important committees of Congress. She's on the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy. And again, she's an extensive writer in all this subject matter. You, you'll, you'll see her, if you don't already know her, you'll see her frequently on the Wall Street Journal page and all of the important dailies. Uh, and she is the author, most recently, of a book called Monetary Meltdown. Again. Our subject, the dollar, the euro, and the international monetary order, what is the United States to do? To give us the first set of answers to that question, please join me in welcoming Steve Hankey to the podium. Thank you, Bill. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to keep my remarks brief. Uh, and go as fast as I possibly can because actually I have quite a bit I want to say. Uh, we're here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, as Bill indicated uh, earlier, we're going to talk about exchange rates and international money, but being here at Heritage, I thought it was appropriate to bring in Milton Friedman to the conversation. Uh, so I will talk about Friedman's views on exchange rates. Uh, let me begin by just indicating that most people who opine about exchange rate regimes are confused and, as a result, obviously confusing when you listen to them. Uh, although Professor Friedman was clear on exchange rate regimes, his works and his advocacy have resulted kind of ironically in a great deal of confusion in general and particularly among free market people. They, they have really no idea what Friedman, uh, I think, actually <laughs> said and stood for uh, when you look at his writings. Uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of international monetary regimes. One is a unified regime, and to think of this, the easiest way to get a handle on it, think of a, a world with one currency. That, that would be a unified monetary regime. Uh, another uh, illustration uh, that's a little more practical, uh, pre-World War II, uh, World War I, I should say, gold standard had a lot of unification. People were, were all, all tied to gold. Uh, many countries were tied to gold, and, and that was uh, largely a, a characteristic or characterized by monetary unification. The second type uh, of general system is what I call a balkanized system, and that's where each individual country uh, has its own central bank uh, and a floating exchange rate and an independent monetary policy in that sense. They're, they're not connected, uh, the countries, one with the other. This is also sometimes associated with what's called monetary nationalism. Uh, and if you look at the developments, contemporary in unification and this balkanization or monetary nationalism, you kind of get the following uh, little things to be thinking about. Uh, balkanization, there, there was a lot of it that occurred after World War I in the interwar period. Lots of new central banks, new currencies, the exchange rates were floating uh, one against the other. The same thing, you had a burst after World War II, uh, and 
particularly in the 50s, as the colonial powers uh, withdrew and countries became independent, it was thought that one of the key things they needed to have was an independent central bank, their own currency, and, and a floating exchange rate. Then, of course, we had the post uh, breakup of the USSR, and that spawned yet a, a, another burst of independent central banks and, and new monies. Uh, at present, the general fad is towards this uh, balkanization or monetary nationalism. This is what's going on with China right now. A lot of pressure on China to float as its exchange rate. It, it obviously has its own central bank and uh, its own currency, but its currency is fixed to the U.S. dollar. So right now it's in a unified currency area with the U.S. dollar. A key event uh, by the way, in terms of this unification versus balkanization occurred in 2003, the G7 meeting in Dubai, and, and the French, of course, in the Quai d'Orsay, the, the foreign office in, in Paris, have pushed for balkanization. They, they, they want to defang U.S. power in, in the sphere of currency, and, and the U.S., well, just fell right into line with this because we've got monetary populism in the United States right now uh, with the main target being China. And so the communique out of that 2003 meeting in Dubai was one in which there were a lot of pressure was put on China to revalue its currency, make it so-called more flexible. And as a result of that, the Asian dollar block, which is a loose unification of Asian currencies around the U.S. dollar also, loosened up. So those are kind of the contemporary developments. Now, let's go back to Friedman. Uh, first, there's Friedman, the balkanizer. Uh, Friedman, in 1953, wrote a very important article titled The Case for Flexible Exchange Rates. Uh, of course, this article has gotten lots of play. It's in his Essays in Positive Economics. And many people think that that's Friedman on exchange rates. He, he was a balkanizer. He, he wanted independent central banks independent currencies, and floating exchange rates. That, that's the, the essence of what's in that 53 article. Also, Friedman, the, the advocate of exchange rates, was very much against the euro, and the euro was a unification movement. It, it got rid of individual currencies and replaced them with a, a, a euro, and, and so you have in effect, fixed exchange rates uh, amongst all the countries that are members of the Eurozone, uh, including, by the way, uh, Montenegro. We, you, Bill mentioned Montenegro. Uh, they had the largest increase in economic freedom, according to the Heritage Index last year, of any country in the world. And Montenegro uses the euro, and the reason they use the euro even though they are not members of the formerly members of the uh, European Union, is because in 1999 in December they adopted the Deutschmark and and got rid of the Yugoslav dinar, even though they were part of the Rump Yugoslavia at the time, and and then when the euro came in and replaced the traditional European currencies, including the Deutschmark, they, they naturally uh, replaced the, the Deutschmark with the euro. Uh, Kosovo also uh, uses the euro, but is not formally a member of uh, the European Union. So, so those two countries are unified. They're in a unified block, you see. This is, this is a unification thing. They're, they're, their currencies... They, they have no currencies of their own, and, and they're using a foreign currency, uh, and that qualifies, that kind of dollarization, shall we say, qualifies as currency unification. Um, 
Now, uh, the other thing Friedman uh, was uh, against was the idea of a fixed exchange rate for China. So you have the, the balkanizer, the key 1953 article, you have him known publicly uh, as being an opponent of the euro, and also uh, being an opponent of the fixed exchange rate in China. Now, Friedman the Unifier, this is what most people aren't aware of. Uh, of course, he, he loves the Hong Kong economy. And the key to the Hong Kong economy is, is not only free trade and a liberal economy, but the fact that they have a currency board system and have had it since 1983 in which the Hong Kong dollar trades at a fixed exchange rate with the U.S. dollar, 7.8 to 1. It's fully convertible. There are no restrictions on it. Uh, and, and Hong Kong is, is running this system really on autopilot. Uh, this currency board system. Uh, that's not the only currency board that uh, Friedman was behind. Uh, in 1992, uh, Kurt Schuller, Lars Yoning, and myself wrote a book on advocating a cur currency board system in Estonia. They uh, actually adopted it, and one of the people who endorsed that book was Friedman. So, again, that's a unified system in the sense that when it started, the Estonian kroon was issued and traded at a fixed rate with the Deutschmark at that time. So it was unified into the Deutschmark zone. So that, that, was, that was a unification example. Also, a very controversial uh, proposal that ultimately didn't see the light of day, but almost did, was in Indonesia in 1998. I was President Suharto's advisor and, and had advocated uh, and advised them to go to a fixed exchange rate system uh, with a currency board uh, approach. And Friedman endorsed that. Uh, if you look in the Far Eastern Economic Review, uh, the sayings of Chairman Milton included uh, an endorsement of the currency board system in Indonesia. Now, so we've got Friedman is a, is a unifier if you, if you look at part of the literature and see part of his advocacy, but, but if you look at other things that aren't so well known, you, you find the unifier, and that is either dollarization using a foreign currency and having no domestic currency or using a currency board in which the exchange rate that you have with your domestic money you issue is fixed to the uh, uh, exchange of a, another foreign currency, another foreign anchor currency. Uh, now, I think, uh, Bill, didn't you pass around some yes, pieces of paper? If, if you... Pick these up. Uh, there's one table called types of exchange rate regimes, and let's let's try to just sort the thing out now. Now that I've kind of laid these these two types of systems out and and gotten Friedman in the picture and and probably confused the issue even more than it already is confused. Let's try to clarify things. There are actually three types of generic exchange rate systems. One's floating, and, 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 and there, obviously, that's some kind of free market mechanism where the supply and demand for the foreign exchange determines the exchange rate, one currency against another. Uh, let's just look across the column under floating, under that free market type of system. Uh, there is a central bank, yes. The exchange rate policy, there is no exchange rate policy because you're, you're not trying to fix the exchange rate. It's just the, the exchange rate's on autopilot moving up and down depending on market conditions. Uh, you have a monetary policy at the central bank with a floating exchange rate. Uh, either you have uh, today, the most popular thing is inflation targeting, but you could have some kind of Friedman type rule where the growth of the monetary base was uh, the target and you control the supply of uh, base money growth in the system. So, so there definitely is a monetary policy followed by the central bank even though there's no exchange rate policy. 
And the source of the monetary base is, is all domestic money. In other words, if you look at the balance sheet of a central bank under a pure floating exchange rate, they, they won't have any foreign exchange on the balance sheet. Or if they do have foreign exchange, since they're not intervening in the, in the market, the foreign exchange will be fixed from month to month to month. It, it'll be, just be the same number there. It, either it'll be zero or it'll be some positive number that just remains the same. So that means the only thing fluctuating on the balance sheet on the asset side are domestic assets. That, that means dom domestic bonds and bills of, of some kind will be go going up and down on the balance sheet. And, and that will be controlled by the central bank. In other words, if, if they want to increase the money supply, and that's on the liability side, what, what, it, what do they do? Well, they're, they're going to buy domestic bonds or bills issued by the government, and to do that, they, they will increase the monetary liabilities on the liability side. Um, now, uh, will there be conflicts between the exchange rate and monetary policy under a pure floating system? No. Uh, there won't be balance of payments crises, and, and, and you'll have no exchange controls. So that's floating, and, and that's kind of intuitive almost, forgetting the balance sheet and so forth. But, but you know, supply and demand in the market for the foreign exchange is, is the name of the game. You... you, you uh, have a market like you have for corn or anything else, and, and people can more or less get their arms around it. Now, a fixed exchange rate is the other extreme, and it is a free market mechanism. A fixed exchange rate is a free market mechanism, and this is where conservatives and free market people get, get confused and, and, and usually have it wrong. <laughs> They're invariably wrong on this issue. Uh, with a fixed exchange rate, well, you have no central bank because with a f one form of a fixed exchange rate is, is like a monetary union or a dollarized system, so, so you have no f central bank with any kind of or monetary uh, authority with any kind of monetary policy. Uh, the ex you have an exchange rate policy. Let's say you have a fixed exchange rate under a currency board system, so you don't have a central bank, you have a fixed rate like Hong Kong I mentioned, or Estonia I mentioned, there are other ones too, Bulgaria is, is in that uh, category. Uh, the policy of the monetary authority, the currency board, is to fix the exchange rate. So, so they do have an exchange rate policy. They have no monetary policy with a currency board. The, the demand for local money, which I'll get into in just a minute, determines the supply or quantity of local money and domestic money that circulates with a currency board system. So there, there is no monetary policy. That's on autopilot. So the difference between floating and, and a fixed rate system with a currency board, those two extremes note that we have a monetary policy with a central bank and floating, and we have flexible exchange rates. But with a currency board system, th th this is the unified kind of approach, no, not the balkanized approach. If we go to a currency board, we have a fixed exchange rate, we have no monetary policy, and we have an exchange rate policy. The, the exchange, there is a policy to fix the exchange rate. Uh, the only source of the monetary base with a fixed, pure fixed exchange rate system is foreign. So if you look at the asset side of the, of the balance sheet of the monetary authority of the currency board, you, you will see fluctuations in foreign exchange, but the domestic assets will either be non-existent or they will be fixed. So it's just the opposite of, of a floating system with a central bank. Uh, there'll be no conflicts between um, exchange rate and monetary policy under a fixed rate system. The, you'll have no balance of payments crises. That it'll be on autopilot, and you have no exchange controls under under either floating or, or the fixed system. Now let's get into the. So 
let's stop for just a minute. Friedman. Well, where was Friedman on this? Friedman, if you read all of his writings, he, he was for both these kinds of systems. He, he wrote the case for flexible exchange rates in 1953. He was for a pure free market floating without exchange controls in a central bank. And he wrote many articles that were for monetary unification through currency board systems in which you had fixed exchange rates, full convertibility, no exchange controls. So those are both, in short, free market mechanisms to handle balance of payments. And they're both on autopilot. They're, they're, they're automatically tending to keep balance of payments from problems from erupting on you. Now, the PEG system. The PEG system is very popular. We see a lot of PEG systems throughout the world. And, and what you have with a PEG system, it looks a little bit like a fixed exchange rate because the PEG system, the, the exchange rate's pegged. And it will stay pegged maybe for quite, quite some time and, and then blow up on you. And here are the characteristics. You have a central bank. You have an exchange rate policy because you're pegging your exchange rate. You also have a monetary policy. You're, you're trying to control the, the, the money supply. And, and as a result of that, the sources of the monetary base are both foreign and domestic. In other words, the balance sheet will have domestic assets in there for the central bank, and it'll have foreign exchange assets, and they'll all be fluctuating around. Uh, you can have sterilization in the system. You also can have conflicts between exchange rate and monetary policy. You can also, and invariably, run into balance of payments crises, and, and you probably will have exchange controls. You don't necessarily have to have them, but you probably will have exchange controls with a PEG system. So where is Friedman on this issue? Well, he's very much against pegged exchange rates because... He, he was focused primarily, even in his 1953 article, on exchange controls and, and the lack of, of full convertibility. Now, the last little diagram, and this is really for the, the uh, again, the free market people who somehow think fixed exchange rates aren't free market mechanisms. And this is just a supply and demand diagram for the Hong Kong Monetary Authority the exchange rate C is, is fixed at 7.8 Hong Kong dollars for one U.S. dollar. So the supply curve, is it, it's, the, it's that horizontal straight line going across. So at that fixed exchange rate, the, the monetary authority is willing to supply a, a completely elastic amount of, uh, of Hong Kong dollars. Now, how much will they supply? Well, it depends on what the demand in the market is for Hong Kong dollars. So you start out with that first demand curve on the left and, and, and then increase the demand for Hong Kong dollars. What happens? Well, people take their foreign exchange to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and, and they want, in exchange at 7.8, they want Hong Kong dollars. And so we shift that demand curve out to the right, and what happens? You read down on the quantity axis, and, and the quantity, the money supply in Hong Kong, increases. So this is a mechanism in which the demand, in effect, for Hong Kong dollars determines the quantity of Hong Kong dollars circulating in Hong Kong. But it's completely a free market mechanism. This isn't some rigged price control, rent control kind of thing. It, it, the market always clears where supply is equal to demand. There are no restrictions in Hong Kong on convertibility, and, and Hong Kong is uh, keeping uh, the domestic assets on its balance sheet constant. The only thing fluctuating is foreign exchange. Now, I would like to close by simply saying that, and we can... I, I'm certain we'll be discussing this. W what about China? Well, China has a pegged exchange rate system. If you look in the table in the category, its exchange rate, it, they have a central bank. The exchange rate is pegged. It, f it moves once in a while. 
and, and but but right now, since 2008, has I actually been been pegged at a fixed exchange rate. However, the key issue, and this is the one on, on Capitol Hill they're not focusing on, the key issue in terms of flexibility in China is convertibility. The, the Chinese yuan is not convertible. <laughs> they have capital controls. This is the issue about flexibility. So the whole debate about revaluing, when they say make the yuan more flexible, is, is just missing completely the whole point. Because... People who say that, by the way, and particularly conservative people, say, oh, we have to have do that because we have to have a free market in foreign exchange in, in China. That is not the issue with, with, uh, with, with, with free market in China. As you saw with the illustration I went through with Hong Kong, which is part of China, the issue is they don't have convertibility, one, and two, they do lots of sterilization. In other words, if you look at the balance sheet, of the central bank in China, the, the foreign exchange, we all know that that's going up. But we have lots of fluctuations going on in domestic assets. And when you have that, you know that there's sterilization or neutralization going on. So the issue with China to improve the system and make it more free market, and, and my uh, uh, embrace of, of kind of the ideal system is that they should become on the mainland more like Hong Kong. In other words, keep the exchange rate fixed. Stability is very important. It's very important that China remains part of a large unified currency area with the U.S. dollar. But let's make the system more free market by moving to convertibility and, and, and also at the same time uh, reducing uh, the sterilization and intervention in the uh, in, in the market through sterilization. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. We'll have an opportunity following uh, Dr. Shelton's remarks for question and answer, but I'm I'm certain that Steve's remarks will not generate a single question. So I'll make sure that I have one ready to go. Uh, at this point, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Judy Shelton to the podium. Thanks so much, Bill. It's a real pleasure to be here at Heritage, where the founding principles that have made America such a uniquely successful nation, where individuals can prosper through their own creativity and entrepreneurial energy, their own self-discipline. Thank you, Heritage Foundation, for rigorously defending those principles of free markets and personal responsibility. You have your work cut out for you. Today, we're here to talk about the dollar, the euro, the international monetary order, or lack thereof, and to ask, what should the US do? And my answer is, we need to go back to those same founding principles that spelled out the conditions under which a free people would tolerate the mixed blessing of government. The goal of the founders was to limit government. They recognized that power corrupts, that governments have a tendency to encroach, to usurp, until before you know it, the people running the government think that the citizens work for them and the system supports them. This way of thinking has taken over the meaning of money. The money you earn, the money you save, the money you invest, the value of that money is up for grabs. Now, the Federal Reserve is responsible for price stability, also for maximizing employment, which often makes for conflicting goals. But let's assume the Fed decides that 2% inflation is reasonable as a normal monetary policy goal. Well then, just know that over the next 10 years, over and above all the taxes you pay, income taxes, sales tax, because you use government-supplied money, it's the legal tender, after all, 
you will also give up another 18% of what you've earned and saved because that's how much 2% inflation reduces the purchasing power of your money in 10 years' time. If inflation averages 4%, well, then you'll give up one-third of the value of the money you earned. Its purchasing power will be only 67% of what it was 10 years earlier. That is an egregious violation of your property rights. And if you're wondering how all this ties into a discussion of the dollar and the euro and why we need to be thinking in terms of fundamental monetary reform, let me explain that one of the biggest constraints on Germany in dealing with this euro crisis, this question of bailing out Greece, one of the biggest concerns for German Chancellor Angela Merkel relates to precisely that, to property rights. In 1998, shortly before the euro was launched, a case was brought before the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe, it's the highest court in the land, challenging the legality of adopting the euro to replace the Deutschmark, the currency that became the very symbol of Germany's post-war economic miracle. The case was brought by three professors of economics who argued that the potential risk of inflation in this new currency, which German citizens would be forced to accept, meant that their property rights guaranteed under the German constitution were being infringed. Now, the professors did not win the case, but the court ruled in its 1998 decision that it was fundamentally important that the stability of the euro be guaranteed as a precondition for giving up the German national currency. So that is the dilemma and potential legal challenge Chancellor Merkel is facing. Those same professors are ready to go back to court to press their case again, still demanding that guarantee of stability in the currency that they are required to use and still determined to assert their property rights as defined under the German Constitution established in 1949. And even though the Constitutional Court earlier ruled in favor of adopting the euro with the requirement that the German government would ensure that the euro currency union was stable at its core, in a ruling last year, that same court was critical about the lack of democratic accountability of EU institutions and insisted that the Bundestag, the German parliament, would remain the ultimate source of legitimacy. Democratic accountability. We are hearing those words in this country being used more and more often. They are being applied to actions taken by the Federal Reserve as citizens are starting to demand transparency, to challenge the authority of the Fed, and to question the stability and the integrity of its product, the dollar, the money we use. No matter what you think of Congressman Ron Paul's various policy stances, you cannot dismiss a legislative motion to audit the Fed that has 319 co-sponsors in the House and 32 co-sponsors in the Senate. And let me just say that for the Treasury to oppose a measure in the name of protecting the Fed's independence is laughable. Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke work as a tag team. We have symbiotic fiscal and monetary policy. Well, the reason it's important to today's discussion, this challenge to Fed authority, is because the stability of the dollar, its reliability, its role as a global reserve currency has come into question. Now, as an economist, what I focus on is whether the dollar or any currency, the euro, the yuan, the ruble, whether that currency fulfills the basic purposes of money. Does it function as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value? 
Well, as we've seen, you can define a new legal tender for a nation or a group of nations. You can get them to embrace a new currency as the official medium of exchange. But the proof of the pudding, the validity of that currency, is derived from its ability to serve as a meaningful unit of account and a reliable store of value. By meaningful unit of account, I mean, does it accurately transmit price signals? Does it allow free markets to function properly so that buyers and sellers can discern the price at which optimal value is attained, that point where demand and supply equilibrate so that the interplay of free market forces leads to optimal economic outcomes for producers and consumers? By reliable store of value, I mean, can individuals be confident that the money they earn today will retain its purchasing power into the future? Can they safely assume that if they make a decision today to forego consumption, choosing instead to save their money for the future, can they feel assured that their money will keep its value, that its purchasing power will not be eroded through inflation? Because if money can't perform those two functions, then it's not a very good product. Now, if we add competition and currencies, real competition, like the private competitive currency approach envisioned by Frederick von Hayek, well, then people would have a choice. They could choose a form of privately issued money that did provide a meaningful unit of account and a reliable store of value. I'm not talking about the games played by speculators in foreign exchange markets, betting on this beauty contest of currencies where governments are the only money suppliers allowed into the market and it's run like a strict cartel. I'm talking about the kind of money that is needed to provide a solid foundation for free market capitalism. I'm talking about sound money, money that serves the needs of entrepreneurs rather than the ambitions of government. Remember, money is supposed to be a tool. It's meant to provide a useful measure, a standard, so that individuals can make rational decisions about what to buy, what to produce, where to invest. The problem with money today, the dollar, the euro, the entire global monetary non-system, is that money is not providing a standard of value. It's being used as an instrument of government policy. You know, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has recently come out with a new recommendation, what it calls a new macroeconomic policy framework that advocates that government policymakers should aim for a higher target inflation rate not the 2% they aim for today, but rather 4% target inflation as the norm. And that way, central bankers would have more room to ease monetary policy during a crisis by lowering the nominal interest rate that has been jacked up 4% over the real rate to compensate for the built-in inflation. And the IMF argues that this improved policy maneuverability justifies whatever damage is inflicted on the economy through inflation. I'm not kidding. Um, go to their website, read it, and weep, because when policy maneuverability by government is deemed more important than the integrity of the money itself, by the very organization brought into existence to ensure a level monetary playing field, because remember, the IMF was created to oversee a fixed exchange rate system, the Bretton Woods system, anchored by a U.S. dollar convertible into gold. Well, the IMF's new policy approach testifies to the fact that money has been co-opted by governments. Its fundamental usefulness as a unit of account, a store of value, has been utterly compromised. I think people sense 
what is happening, both in Europe and the United States. I think people understand that there is now a disconnect between money and the real economy. In the prelude to the financial crisis that brought the global economy to its knees in late 2008, the face value of over-the-counter financial derivatives reached the amount of $684 trillion, according to the Bank for International Settlements. That's more than 12 times the value of global GDP. Anyone contemplating those numbers can't help but wonder, what's going on? How could that much financial value, that much value in monetary terms, be created? What is the underlying real asset that's being measured? Because the next thing we all knew, the whole global economy was failing, with policymakers in Washington and Brussels insisting that government bailouts, i.e. taxpayer bailouts, were the only way to deal with this financial crisis, the worst since the Great Depression of the 1930s. How can that much value, if it was ever real, collapse into nothing. I'm not the only one to lament this wag-the-dog situation between the world of speculative finance powered by loose money and the world of productive enterprise. The disconnect between money, finance, and the real economy is ongoing, with private sector entrepreneurs trying to run small businesses still finding it extremely difficult to get a loan from their local bank, even though interest rates are near zero. Speaking at Stanford University last month, the head of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, noted that finance has lost contact with its raison d'etre. That's what he said. Finance has come to serve itself rather than the real economy. It comes down to this. In the absence of sound money, you can't have rational finance. Money is the fundamental component of finance. No subprime mortgage, no credit default swap, no exotic derivative can be structured without stipulating the monetary unit of account in which its value is calculated. It's the money that is broken. And so long as money distorts assessments of value, so long as it conveys false price signals, the entire economic structure is unstable. People are motivated to chase paper profits through currency speculation, arbitraging the nuanced comments of central bank officials or policymakers, rather than apply their talents to generating real wealth that lifts the economic prosperity of society. Money is just a marker in a game, a dangerous and disillusioning game. We need to get back to sound money. We need to rescue the private sector, the productive part of the economy, from this constant boom and bust cycle that undermines free market capitalism, that makes people question its validity as an economic system, and even question its virtue as a political philosophy where individuals are valued and human freedom is upheld. <coughs> How we address the fundamental conflict between sound money and spendthrift government will have a huge impact on the future shape of Europe and the essential character of America going forward. Unless we restore money's basic purpose, unless we link it once again to a measure of universally recognized value in such a way that, quoting Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, it makes the determination of money's purchasing power independent of the ambitions and machinations of governments, of dictators, of political parties, and of pressure groups. Unless we do that, we can never have sound money. We can never have an international monetary order worthy of the name. Thank you.
Uh, Judy, that was that was that was just stunning. I'm going to run this session to about 11:45, 11:40, 11:45, depending upon questions. Uh, let me remind you before we go to questions that there will be uh, coffee, soft drinks outside for a, during the break. I'd like, to, like like you all to come back at noon to hear the sort of concluding piece by Robert Mundell. A wonderful setup for that. Steve's remarks and Judy's remarks this morning. Just just tremendous. Okay, we have a, a very simple rule here, and I'll call on Warren first. Um, we have a microphone because we have a, a, an even larger audience on the Internet, and they really like to hear the questions. So there's, if you would speak into the microphone, which you'll be given, and if you would, I'd ask you, you don't necessarily have to, this is a free society, I identify yourself prior to, this, to, to speaking, that would be wonderful. Warren Coates. Thank you. Warren Coates, IMF retired. Uh, Judy, in, in the interests of honesty, the IMF has not advocated a 4% target rate of inflation. One of its staff members published a paper in which he suggested that which is, which is clearly disclaimed as not being IMF policy. The Ron Paul audit gives the impression that the Fed has not been audited. The Fed has been audited regularly for many, many years. What the Ron Paul uh, proposal would do uh, is audit the Fed's monetary policy, its decisions about whether to increase the rate of growth of the money supply or decrease the rate of growth of money supply and so on, for which the Fed is now accountable to Congress, and it reports to Congress on how well it fulfills this. You're quite right that there's a conflict between the unemployment mandate and the price stability mandate, but Ron Paul's amendment is directly aimed at the independence of the Federal Reserve. Uh, finally, life is not certain. There are no guarantees. There's no perfectly stable money. Gold certainly is not. There is nothing else in the world that is. So the choice is between better and worse regimes. Let's not think that there is something out there that's perfect. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Judy, would you like to respond? I think we can do better than what we have today. And I think we need to think about money as a tool to generate productive wealth. As far as uh, the gentleman at the IMF, uh, Olivier Blanchard, he's the economic counselor for the IMF. He is the head of the IMF research department, and that paper is prominently displayed on the IMF website. I think it's indicative of IMF thinking that the solution is to use money as a shock absorber for government policy <coughs> mistakes rather than having money function in what I consider its basic role, uh, a much more productive role. Good. Uh, uh, Derek, Derek Scissors. Uh, Derek Scissors Heritage. This is for Professor uh, Hanking. Um, a, a critical comment and a question. They're both short. The fixed versus floating regime you set out, in the, in the fixed uh, currency market you have demand moving. In the floating market you have demand and price moving. Price signals are everything. They're not equivalently free markets. You have the government setting prices. That's my critical comment. The question is, on feasible policy with respect to China, um, I, I take some of your points, notwithstanding the earlier comment, but as a feasible policy, we have two choices. Push China towards a, a, what you would call a floating regime or push them towards what you would call a fixed regime. One requires them to give up, effectively, their, the People's Bank of China as any sort of meaningful actor. Do you think that's at all reasonable? I mean, we're not talking about ideally what China would do. We're talking about what China's willing to do. Under your notion of a fixed regime, there's no central bank. What do you think the likelihood of, of getting the Chinese to give up the People's Bank is? Well, I think the, the best way to – when I said in this idealized table that I have out there that you'd have no central bank, in fact, many currency board arrangements, they have central banks. There's a central bank in Estonia. There's a central bank in Bulgaria. The thing is, they don't have a monetary policy. Their hands are tied. They have an exchange rate policy, and the thing is on autopilot with, with no sterilization, uh, full convertibility of currency. 
And it's very clear to me what the Chinese want to do. They, they want fixity in the exchange rate. They, they want to be part of a unified currency area with, with the world's main currency, the U.S. dollar. It, it's, it, just look at the reveal preference. That's what they want. Now, the, the, the issue is, and the only issue with regard to free markets, flexibility, all this language, what that really means in that context, if you want a fixed exchange rate, you have to have full convertibility. And then you would have to, the central bank would also have to have a policy where, where they weren't neutralizing foreign exchange inflows or outflows. There could be huge outflows. If, if we go to full convertibility in China, uh, my conjecture is there'll, there'll be massive capital outflows from China, and, and there won't be the speculative fl inflows going in. If you, if you knew <coughs> you were really on a fixed exchange rate system and, 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 and they were going to stay that way and, and they weren't going to, going to cave in to pressures from the outside, the pressures from the outside aggravate the system. They, they, they cause, the, in large part, the reserve increases and these surges in reserves at the central bank now because you've got hot money inflows coming in. The hot money inflows, why do they come in? They, they come in, it, it, they're taking the temperature of, of you know, the Europeans and the U.S., how much pressure they're putting on the Chinese to so-called make the system more flexible, meaning revalue the peg, move, move the peg either a one-time thing or put it like they had it from 2005 to 2008 on a crawling peg kind of basis where it was kind of crawling up all the time for a cumulative revaluation of about 20 or 21 percent. So I, I think fixity is, is the reality of what they've already revealed to us. That, that is, they, they don't want to go to floating. What, what they're resisting is the convertibility. I mean, even the ruble is convertible. <laughs> I mean, this is the one thing, everybody's you know, always bad mouthing Putin about this, that, or the other thing. Well, Putin happened to be in charge when they made the ruble convertible. I mean, the first time since World War One that the ruble has been convertible. By the way, on this uh, unification thing, I did uh, forget to mention one thing. As long as I have the microphone here for a second, <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it. Uh, on Friedman, the big the big Friedman story on on unification. Remember I said the balkanizer, we, we all know that story. Everybody just thinks he's floating and that's the end of it and, and that's the only kind of free market mechanism. This is just nonsense. <laughs> he, he, he was also a big unifier and, and to get that in context, I, I said, well, Estonia and Indonesia, but if you really put it in context, what he was talking about, and I've talked about this with, with Milton, is getting rid of about a hundred central banks around the world that are lousy. <laughs> so, so that's almost, it's over half the total central banks in the world. He, he would want to either have them get rid of their currency and their central bank and use a foreign currency, that's dollarized, or have a currency board system with a fixed exchange rate. Remember, remember unification is fixed exchange rate. Balkanizer is flexible. <laughs> Monetary nationalism is flexible. Good. Judy, do you have anything you'd like to say on that? No. All right, good. Well said. I respect Steve's opinion. Good. We have a question right here. Uh, Hi, my name is uh, Dave Doctor. I'm not affiliated with anyone, but uh, I have a question for Steve. Um, uh, in regards to fixed, I see that sort of as outsourcing your central bank uh, in a way. And uh, one of the reasons to adopt, a, well, really it's a monopoly bank, uh, a monopoly central bank, is that you can take the money of everyone, you know, take the purchasing power of anyone, everyone who uses the money issued by the central bank. Uh, and that's why governments, you know, institute it from my point of view. So if you outsource it, what's the real benefit um, of using someone else's central bank if you can't, if you're not getting the benefit of taking your citizens' purchasing power? Um, is there a quid pro quo? quid quo pro, where if I decide to use the European Central Bank as a country, they'll then buy my, um, lend me money, you know, buy my debt? No, what, what, what typically you get with the, with the unification, this is the, the hundred central bank 
Friedman scenario where you get rid of a hundred that are just lousy performers. Now, what's lousy performance? It means high inflation, very high endemic inflation relative to the, the, the euro, relative to the dollar, relative to the old Deutsche Mark. That, that is what you're getting rid of. Now, what happens when you do that? You, you do one thing immediately. Interest rates come way down. In, inter, inflation comes down, but the reality is, what, what's it mean for Main Street? Judy was talking about Main Street and so forth. It means that your cost of financing co collapses. If you look at the introduction of the U.S. dollar in uh, Ecuador and El Salvador, in 2000 and 2001, respectively, interest rates came, came crashing down in those places. So the credit card debt, consumer credit, uh, working capital for businesses, all these things, it, it really comes way down. And what you end up with is more rapid growth in those countries that have unified. I, I've studied all these countries that have had unified currency systems since 1953. And their inflation rates are much lower, the cost of capital is much lower, and, and their growth rates are considerably higher, their real growth rates, than countries that have independent central banks. And, and in addition to that, I, I know there'll be more discussion about Greece later on, but with unification, you tend to get, tend, I say, tend to get a hard budget constraint on the fiscal situation. So, Fiscal deficits tend to be less, smaller, and, and the total amount of debt that you're uh, running relative to GDP tends to be smaller in these countries. So you just, you just get superior economic performance by farming it out, if you want to put it that way, in kind of a derogatory way, but I, I would put it, you know, why shouldn't China be farming out its monetary policy and, and be driving in the you know the best kind of car available rather than trying to fool around with their own thing where the, where they don't really have all the mechanisms to do this so-called flexibility thing. I mean, if I, I I don't think a pure floating exchange rate really is feasible, and I, and I don't think they think it's feasible, and that's why they've kept to this pegging. Thing and, and we just have to, yeah. I, I think if we're pushing in terms of the policy sphere, it's convertibility is the, is the issue. Judy? I, I just want to go all the way with the idea of a, a unifor, unified monetary area. One of my favorite aphorisms from uh, Robert Mundell is his observation that the only closed economy is the global economy. The U.S. talks a lot about the global marketplace and opportunity and uh, free trade. And we're very proud when we reduce tariffs, say, 10% down to 3%. But when you have these massive currency shifts of 20, 30, 40%, that swamps the effect of reducing tariffs to really be true to the idea of giving everyone a chance to participate in the, in the global marketplace. So I just think that um, the U.S. needs to demonstrate leadership. We need to start thinking about why money serves the needs of the productive people. And um, it's going to involve fundamental reform in our own outlook. Not to use money as a, as a trade weapon, not to say we're being more competitive because we devalue the dollar. That's not competing. That's cheating. I have two more questions from the audience I'd like to take before we, before we break. So if you keep their, your answers just robustly clo uh, short, we can get them in. And they're both in the back of the room. Uh, sir, uh, yours, yours is first, and then yours is second and last. My name is Ralph Benko. I'm with the American Principles Project. Um, my old boss, Ronald Reagan, was kind of unabashedly for the gold standard. My old friend, Jack Kemp, was unabashedly for the gold standard. Uh, this is more an invitation than a question. The, the word gold convertibility, the words gold convertibility haven't really come up, and I'd like to invite each of you to, you know, make any observation that you have to say about that. Judy, you have anything to say? <laughs> well, my, my sense, I always talk about going back to founding principles because in the Constitution, of course, only gold and silver were considered appropriate forms of money. 
and uh, Congress had the power to regulate the value of money, but that only meant that they could say, as Jefferson said, we'll define a dollar, and this is what a dollar is. And it had to be in terms of gold and silver. Uh, I think that we should really be thinking of back to the future, because what we're seeing is the big problem with the issue of sound money <coughs> is politics. Having a single currency is fantastic. I wish we could transcend what happened with the euro and, and Bob's concept turning into reality into, into global. We should have a, a global monetary unit of account. That would be fair. Then you transmit price signals across borders. But we see that the politics are what kill it. And Bretton Woods, it was the U.S. ability, frankly, to intimidate its allies. It was easy to say, you want to convert your dollars into gold? Well, maybe we want to yank our, our NATO troops out of Europe and you can protect yourselves against the Soviet Union. And so, um, to me, the only really politically neutral asset that would give intrinsic value to a global monetary system has to be gold. Mm. Where do you find it? In, in the central banks around the world. They certainly think so. And you see it in the private sector, people buying gold. This is universally recognized, and it's historically been the neutral asset. There you go. And our, the last question will be also on the back row. And please identify yourself. Thank you, Alexander Tsaruk, uh, Budget Committee of Ukrainian Parliament. I'm advisor. Uh, excuse me for my English. Uh, my question to Judy, uh, please, um, uh, what do you, what, how do you uh, determine inflation? You know, uh, Ukrainian economy um, was uh, with uh, consumer price inflation uh, lower than f about 5%, and uh, GDP deflator index was more than 20%. This is the real inflation index. And uh, the next thing, how do you, uh, how are you going to save U.S. economy? Uh, uh, my proposal is, uh, what do you think about uh, set up um, such kind of mastery uh, criteria to your national legislation to control your uh, level of federal and local debt and deficit by macroeconomic indices uh, connected with GDP. For example, 60% of federal and local government debt to control your uh, general government debt. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's, Thank let's, you. let's let Judy uh, choose which one you want to work on there. Okay. Quickly, um, how to save the U.S. Um, I'm leaving that to Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> Putting in a pretty good effort. Done. Um, and I'm, I, I'm for, for instance, on the U.S. fiscal situation, proposals like Mike Pence is putting forward about putting a limit on spending as a percentage of GDP. Uh, if you're going to let government issue money, then they have to have a balanced budget, or you've immediately compromised the product. Uh, I know uh, Domingo Cavallo, who set up the currency board for Argentina, uh, he used to say that, that money is a moral contract between the government and the citizens. And so if you have to enforce that with more legal measures or constitutional measures, I'm for that. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent note to end this first session of two sessions. Uh, we will reconvene in 15 minutes, but before we leave for break, join me in thanking Steve Hankey and Judy Shelton. I'd like to uh, get started again, and before I introduce J.D. Foster, who will introduce Professor Mundell, I'd like to draw your attention to the 2010 Index of Economic Freedom. Uh, last night at the Metropolitan Club, thanks to the uh, membership of our uh, trustee, Bill Middendorf, who's here in the front row, uh, we collected... Uh, eight embassies, 12 countries, uh, at an event to celebrate the tremendous progress that these countries have made in the index. Uh, Terry Miller, who is with us today, uh, directs the Center for International Trade and Economics, 
and uh, is responsible, has all the headaches for producing this, this wonderful book. And, and why do I connect this book to this lecture? Uh, economic freedom is uh, intimately tied to money, monetary policy, and the financial institutions that are therein connected to money and monetary policy. And so often now we're seeing countries making huge progress by getting the money right. Uh, Macedonia rose by 21 points, and they were the winners last night of the contest of most improved nations, and they're extremely proud of that. Uh, we're extremely proud of uh, J.D. Foster, who uh, has uh, joined us several years ago to, as the Norman Touré Fellow in a whole host of issues dealing with government spending and entitlements and tax reform. Uh, J.D. and I have uh, worked the vineyards of Washington for a long, long time together. Uh, he has been the president of the Tax Foundation. He has been a ma major guru in the House of Representatives. Uh, just prior to coming to uh, the Heritage Foundation, he was the chief economist of the Office of Management and Budget in the Bush administration, knows his way around economics as well as anybody in this town. And, J.D., I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a wise man once said, an international monetary system in the strict sense of the word does not presently exist. Every country has its own. Now, if you ask yourself, how does every country have its own international monetary system, you see the paradox we face and the nugget of wisdom. And as you can imagine, the wise observation was made by Robert Mundell, our speaker. As we make the transition from a leverage and monetary policy-driven global financial crisis to a possible glo global sovereign debt and exchange rate driven crisis, I can hardly scarce, I can scarcely imagine anyone whose observations and judgments would be more on point to the issues of the day. Robert Mundell has been a professor, professor of economics at Columbia University since 1974, having received his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts of Institute and Technology in 1956 and going on to teach at the University of Chicago for some years. Since 2001, he has had, held the rank of university professor, Columbia's highest rank. Within the academic community, he is likely best known for the Mundell Fleming model of an open macro economy that elegantly ties together monetary policy, fiscal policy, balance of payments, and exchange rates. This model, developed with Marcus Fleming, remains the default model for much exchange rate research today. His pioneering work in optimal currency areas laid the groundwork for the introduction of the euro as a circulating currency in 2002. He received a Nobel Prize for Economics in 1999, specifically for his lecture, A Reconsideration of the 20th Century. And while many have claimed to have been at the founding of supply-side economics, if one in fact were to have a picture of the actual founders, their ranks would be few, including the great Art Laffer, my friend and mentor, Norman Ture, and Dr. Mundell. Together, they broke through the stale cons consensus to help the world realize the tremendous debilitating effects of high marginal tax rates. With a man of Dr. Mundell's breadth of contributions and long and distinguished tenure, one can at length recite his numerous awards and varied service to the betterment of the human condition or sit down and let the man talk. I choose the latter. On behalf of the Heritage Foundation, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Lund Mark Lundell. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, one little comment i make on it is that uh, I actually never wrote the, a paper with Marcus Fleming on the Mundell Fleming model. They were independent uh, sort of works. I did write a paper with Marcus Fleming. Uh, it was on the forward exchange market. And uh, we had, uh, after that, uh, that uh, um, experience with my, my dear friend, Marcus, and uh, uh, my, um, actually he was my, uh, the head of the division at the IMF when I was in there, so he's my boss in some sense, uh, I decided I would never write another paper with anyone else again. <laughs> he was, uh, but he was a very sharp, sharp guy. Now, um, I've listened to the discussions uh, today, and um, uh, uh, very interesting. I found them. Uh, I wanted to say, pick up on some of the things about exchange rates before I go into the 
the subject of what I'm really going to talk on. Uh, the, uh, there is a, a fixed and flexible exchange rate. Notice that's a poor way, in a way, of, of phrasing the question because some people think that fixity is a bad thing. It's in free markets, so fixity is a bad thing, whereas flexibility is a good thing. On the other hand, in terms of standards, uh, fi fixity is a good thing, but flexibility is a bad thing. You can't have, you can have flexible standards, moral standards, other things like this. So inflexibility can be a virtue. Uh, I don't like the way that that uh, uh, works. And um, see, I think I, you know, that one. Um, um, after my Nobel Prize uh, came out in 1999, uh, given in December, uh, in the next year, Terry Corcoran at the uh, National Post of Canada asked me if I would engage in a debate with Milton Friedman, which we could do by email, on fixed versus flexible exchange rates. And uh, I said I'd be very flattered to do that. And so he called Milton, and Milton agreed to it. We were good friends. But it turned out to be uh, such a, a thing. It, uh, I was traveling around the world then, giving speeches and writing these answers out by email and getting them back. For, fortunately, it couldn't have happened without email. And the, but quickly, uh, he, Terry asked each of us three questions. We each gave our answers to them, and then each of us question the other answer. And so the debate mushroomed. Eventually, uh, Terry Corcoran had to get eight people, professors, down to try to sort out and, and to put this out, what was going to be the result. And they whittled it down to eight issue, in eight issues of the National Post of Canada. It came out as, under the title, the, uh, um, the Monetary Duel, Monetary Duel. And it was, uh, uh, it, it took uh, eight issues. And finally, uh, Milton said, I'm not going to do any more of it. But at the very beginning, I said to him, I would do this, uh, to talk to Milton, first of all, that I don't want to talk about fixed versus flexible exchange rates unless we make a very important provision that we're assuming monetary stability. Because you, if you have a flexible exchange rates, you could have hyperinflation. All countries that have, hy have hyperinflation have flexible exchange rates because it's impossible to fix them. Uh, and or it could be deflation. So we have to, and that's very important because a lot of people think when you move from fixed to flexible exchange rates, you've got another degree of freedom. And uh, that's only true if you give up monetary stability. But the real issue is between one form of monetary stability and another. The monetary stability based on fixed exchange rates or the monetary stability based on, say, inflation targeting or in, in Milton Friedman's earliest uh, proposal, uh, his uh, fixed rate of monetary expansion. So you have three definitions of monetary stability. In China, by the way, when China wrote their law in 1995, and I well, had, may have had a little part in it. They defined monetary stability. The goal of the central bank was monetary stability, but did not say whether monetary stability should be achieved through keeping a given price level stable or whether it should be um, kept by giving, um, um, uh, uh, keeping the uh, exchange rate stable. And at that time, they were fixing uh, the exchange rate. They were beginning to fix the exchange rate in a way. Now, uh, in, in, in uh, 2002, uh, Milton Friedman had his 90th birthday. It was just shortly after the monetary duel uh, had been published. And um, uh, I went in to the room where Milton was. It was just a small gathering at Chicago. He'd come back from California to Chicago for this. And he said, well, Bob, you and I have got the whole world, seems to me we've got the whole world picked up together. You've got fixed rates and I've got flexible exchange rates. And that covers the whole world. And, and then I said whether, yes, yes, I agree with you, Milton, but I've got the best part because I've got the inner part of the United States. The U.S. is a, a common currency, is a fixed exchange rate zone. 
and a, 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 a good, perfect fixed exchange rate system, a very good fixed exchange rate system, uh, operates very close to a common currency. I'll give you one illustration. Uh, Belgium and Luxembourg had a fixed exchange rate for 50 years with never any problem in it because monetary, because Luxembourg franc didn't only circulate really in Luxembourg. The Belgian franc could circulate anywhere. And, uh, and the central bank of Luxembourg, the, the Luxembourg didn't have a central bank. It had a monetary institute. And it just kept the, a certain amount of these currencies, currencies. So that was a perfectly working fixed exchange rate, but it was a passive one for Luxembourg. But they were outsourcing, if you like, the monetary policy in the way you, way you put this. And that, that worked perfectly. Another example that's lasted even longer was uh, Panama in, since 1904, it's had a fixed exchange rate with the, uh, uh, with the dollar. And uh, the Balboa is fixed to the dollar, but the Balboa is only a coin. It's not a paper currency. They decided not to, they, they, in the treaty that signed with the United States it, in 1904, it said the Panama will not create uh, a paper currency. And of course, they can change that any time they like because the Americans would, would certainly say yes if they want to, but they've decided to keep it that way because that way they have the most stable monetary system in Latin America. Of course, they have the stability of the dollar that comes from this, and they get, have over, over uh, uh, that, uh, that 106 years, they've got a price level that more or less mimics the dollar price level. Of course, the indexes are, are a little different because the basket of goods consumed and produced in, in uh, Panama is very different from that of the United States, but still the trends are all very clear there. If you have fixed exchange rates, uh, con uh, inflation rates are more or less the same. In the 19th century, uh, four big countries, uh, the U.S., Britain, uh, France, and Germany, uh, had uh, all had fixed exchange rates with the, uh, uh, all were on the gold standard. And uh, the gold standard had uh, gave them all uh, a fixed exchange rate and a common price level. And if you look back over the series uh, in those countries, you see that the cycles, business cycles, there definitely were inflation, deflation, inflation and deflation, a regular Kondratiev type cycle, uh, but they all fit all countries at the same time. The price levels move, move together. They did at that time. Another little point I make, have to make here is about, uh, well, let me carry on another thing about Friedman. Milton Friedman, uh, in 1970, uh, 70, I was in, I, I bought a, a house in, uh, in Tuscany, Siena, and it is, I had a conference in it and, and in, in 1971, and the, the Monte bank was sponsoring this, and they um, uh, asked me if I could get I wrote, they have a journal, the Economic Notes. They come out periodically every four, four issues or every month, I'm not sure now. Um, and they asked me if I would help them get some articles. So I gave them, I published two or three things in it for them of my own. And then they asked me, well, could I get some from someone else? Milton, Milton Friedman, I was a colleague of his at the time, gave me at Chicago, um, gave me his paper he wrote uh, on uh, just after he'd came, come back and he had delivered in Belgrade. And Steve was talking about Milton in Belgrade, and, and uh, this was the, his argument why, uh, why uh, uh, the central bank should fix the dinar to the Deutschmark. Why should they do it? What was his answer? Because Germany has a better monetary policy than Yugoslavia, and that's Yugoslavia had one of the worst monetary policies. So, so uh, and that was, the, that was the way to get an anchor, and that uh, I don't think it was followed up in any real sense. But, but Milton never believed in uh, universal fixed exchange rates. His paper, if you read the paper he wrote at the beginning, his advocacy of, it was a really a pamphlet, not, a, not an economics paper, it was a, making that proposal. Uh, he was talking about really big countries like Britain and the United States, not 
small countries. He thought that in big countries the arguments the arguments were all applied to uh, big countries. Um, the, I should say also that Milton wasn't didn't come into economics through uh, international trade. He really hadn't studied the issue very much. In 19, I don't mean to pa cast aspersions on his knowledge of this, but he didn't. He had a debate with Bob Rosa in 1966. He gave me a copy of it, and I sent it back. Milton, you have to change this because he had the idea that Britain and the United States, Britain was still on a gold standard in, in 1966, and the what you, the textbook way of seeing how adjustment worked was through, through gold, and he was explaining all this through gold. And I said, look, it's the Bank of England sets the limits now, the buying and selling gold. And then he, he said, oh, oh, I, and after I said, did you change that, Milton? Oh, yes, he said, Rosa pointed it out to me, too. too. But, and he, he didn't have a good idea of how the adjustment worked under fixed exchange rates. And I have to say that this is true today of most uh, most students of economics. If you read the textbooks today, how how adjustment between two countries with fi fixed exchange rates work, um, uh, very few students would give you a good answer to it. What they might say, oh, it's the price specie flow mechanism. You have inflation in one country and deflation in the deficit countries, and th that that change of prices brings about the shifts of demand that brings about equilibrium. Of course, they then have to say, uh, if provided the sum of the elasticities of demand for imports and exports are greater than unity. You have to make that because it, it's not at all clear. There's nothing in economics that says that that uh, sum of elasticities has to be the case. But that's what people get out of, of it because they, what they don't make, realize is that it doesn't take place that way at all. If, uh, if, if you take uh, fixed exchange rates between, well, take the United States, uh, take uh, New York and California, uh, that's a fixed exchange rate system. If there's a capital movement from New York to California, are you going to get inflation in California, deflation in the United States? Not at all. You won't get, you won't see that at all. There, you'll see prices change, but expenditures will do the adjusting for this. And if, if there's a disequilibrium created by shifts of expenditures, then there will be relative price changes, but not necessarily in the direction that was initially. Now, this is pretty shocking because this debate, uh, this confusion here, goes back 258 years. 58 years, it goes back, uh, maybe my arithmetic is wrong, uh, to 1252, or even 1248 to 52. And this, two things happened then, uh, all connected with David Hume. David Hume wrote to the French philosopher and economist Montesquieu, and he was criticizing Montesquieu's spirit of laws in which he's talking about devaluation or if, if exchange rates have, having to change, you want you should devalue to increase the money supply of a country or, or do something like this. And Hume said, we in England don't think this has happened at all. We don't determine the money supply. You, t you can't change the money supply by, by uh, the, any kind of uh, fiddling around with currency because the money supply is going to be given by the demand for money. And he, uh, what, that's what, um, what he uh, initially, when he wrote to Montesquieu, he talked, the, he had the idea of a self-adjusting system that would preserve balance of payments equilibrium. Uh, and it would always adjust. But he wasn't clear on what the adjustment mechanism was first. What he did say was that his first letter to Montesquieu was that the surplus country will have, prices will rise in the surplus country and fall in the deficit country, and, and that's the way adjustment will take place. That was his letter to Montesquieu. Then he wrote to uh, his friend when he got, got uh, a little later, he sent this, he wrote up an essay on this, his, his famous essay and um, on this, and he said that uh, uh, John Osgood, uh, and Osgood uh, wrote him back a long, several pages, 
beautiful critique of, of his paper. Osgood was a wonderful economist. He said, how can prices go up in one country and down in another country? If you have trade, trade will equalize these prices. And he said, certainly for international goods that are traded internationally, you can't have prices going up in one country and down in another country. And uh, so, so Hume accepted this adjustment mechanism. And he, 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 not the adjustment mechanism, he accepted this critique. This is what we think of as the law of one price. And he stated the law of one price very carefully. Prices in one country can't be different from prices in another country. And, but then he didn't, what he then said for the adjustment mechanism, um, suppose four-fifths of the money supply of Great Britain were annihilated overnight. And then, then he doesn't say what would happen. Except, he says, what nation on earth can compete with us in manufacturers? That's, um, so, now, it seems to be saying, he seems to be saying something about prices changing, but how does that reconcile with the law of one price? Well, what, what has to work in this is what changes if the money supply is annihilated overnight, expenditure goes down. Total spending goes down. Whether it affects the price level or not will depend. And in the other in another country, spending would go up if, was, if the counterpart to that was a surplus. So, the reduction in the money supply will reduce total spending below income, and that gap will leave the surplus to will generate a surplus, and you'll get back to equilibrium there. And uh, of course, there might be some uh, residual changes, shifts in expenditure that will change relative prices, but they could go in either direction. Because what, what you do is when you have a change, you shift around global, you shift demand in the goods. And of course, if, if uh, gold is, uh, four-fifths of the gold stock has been annihilated overnight, that's a reduction in wealth. And because of that real change, you're not going to get back to the same equilibrium, but it will be a balance of payments equilibrium, but it will not necessarily involve any changes in, uh, in, in price levels uh, in the same way it won't between different prices inside Europe now. Uh, there's no adjustment. So you, the price, the rate of inflation um, is uh, the same in all the European countries. The indexes are a little different. They, they, they may be a fraction of 1% off in the differences, but in nearly all cases, they're about the same. You get uh, that, and you, just as you get the same relative price increases in prices, inflation in the United States. So you have that, uh, that, that th thing uh, working, um, working very well there. The adjustment mechanism works without that. If you have a shift of money from one country, investment from one uh, state to another in the side, you get the effect. The, in, this, in the case of New York, we'll have a surplus, and California will have a deficit because they've got the money to spend that is the counterpart, the financial counterpart to the, to, uh, the, uh, to the loan that's being made. Now, I'll quickly fast forward to uh, give, suggest this model to you. Suppose that China has a fixed exchange rate, and suppose that China uh, decides to buy with, whatever, with, with some, money, some of their reserves 200 or 300 billion dollars of U.S. government bonds. That's a transfer from China to the United States. Now you you don't think of it in that term. You think of it, you think of it as there's a big surplus that China has, and then the bonds come later to get rid of the money. But you see, you you have Steve mentioned the uh, sterilization in China, and he mentioned the uh, the possibility that if if China is buying up. 200 and has a bounce of payment surplus of $250 billion. It has to buy up $250 billion on the exchange market, which will overwhelm the Chinese monetary system enormously. They have to get rid... Now, they, to sterilize it, they could sell $250 billion worth of government bonds or of central bank bonds, because the central bank in China also issues bonds. Uh, but that would be a huge amount. They, that's not the way the adjustment... Work, the sterilization works. The sterilization works. So they buy U.S. bonds, so they make they turn a capital flow. They turn the um, the uh, big trade surplus into a capital flow. So they have equilibrium in the balance of payments. 
Now, now it not, doesn't work exactly like this, but China has a surplus of almost $300 billion in the trade, in trade surplus with the rest of the world. Or I think this year it's got... This year it's gone down, and there was one month when it even went down to, to zero uh, at some point. But, uh, but that's the normal over the past several years. Big transfer, acquisition of government bonds. Now China has maybe $1.2 trillion of U.S. government bonds, and it's making investments uh, the rest of the world. If a country makes a capital export, it'll have a surplus, and there'll be equal in the balance of payments. The way, way that surplus comes about is through the lending, uh, finances, increased spending in the borrowing country or the receiving country, and the borrowing takes the, does the opposite. You have to tax or you have to get some uh, surplus there in order to get the bonds, the money to, uh, to borrow. So the, um, it's a very, uh, uh, what happens to the balance of, to the, um, Balance of payments when there's a capital flow uh, was was never studied so much in the transfer literature. It was only in the, it took there was a debate between uh, Jacob Viner and um, and uh, 1937 38 and uh, uh, who was the other one? Was it, it might have been Hobbler? No, I don't think it was Hobbler um, on this issue. Um, Anyway, though now, so the adjustment mechanism itself is uh, is very complicated. The monetary mechanism is very, is of, under fixed exchange rates is really uh, uh, it seems a little bit complicated because of this past history of the uh, the um, uh, mistaken uh, use of uh, of the price specie flow mechanism. Nobody, no, the price specie flow mechanism, the fact that if you have fixed exchange rates, people say, oh, you, if you have fixed exchange rates, we don't want to have fixed exchange rates. We have to have flexible exchange rates. Otherwise, we'll have to have price inflation and deflation. But tell China that. China has, China has had a better record of, infla of price stability since 1997 uh, to today than any G7 country has done, and they've done it through, except for three years, fixing the exchange rate. Well, let's go now to the <laughs> subject that I was going to talk about, and I want to talk about the, f f um, the financial aspects of the Federal Reserve System and, uh, and the mistake that I think the Federal Reserve made. I think the Federal Reserve made one of the biggest mistakes in history of the Fed since the Fed was started in 1913. I think uh, the, in the, the summer of 2008, they made a huge mistake. Uh, now, uh, so let's uh, go into this to, to see what this is. Now, since 1982, the U.S. has had three long periods of expansion. 1982 was a recession year. The recession hit bottom in that in that year, but the first was 1982 to 90. The seven, what Bob Bartley in his book ca called the seven fat years, uh, he, he wrote uh, wrote about this. The seven fat years of the Reagan administration, with a period of big sweeping tax cuts. Reagan got the tax rates down from. Um, down from 70% uh, uh, in 1980 to, in the top bracket, 28%. Sweeping reduction in the tax rates. Um, <clears throat> supply side uh, su success in many ways. Now, then the second boom was, in, 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 uh, there was a nine-month recession in between. The next boom started in 1991 to 2001. The expansion continued for 10 years, the longest U.S. expansion in, in history, the longest U.S. expansion. So I don't know. Uh, I guess we certainly have to say other countries have had a longer expansion. China. China, of course, has had a, a 31 or 32-year expansion since 1978. So uh, China's had much longer expansions. But uh, the uh, but for the United States, that's the longest the U.S. had. And then the third great boom after the dot-com uh, crash was the Bush expansion of 2002 to eight, in which all the major countries participated. The uh, Bush expansion, housing was a leading component of the Bush expansion. It was fed by three lows: low taxes. Bush, in the first year, with the recession, had a tax reduction 
lowered the tax rate from 39 about 40 percent down to 35 percent. Low interest rates and the low dollar. The central was the housing boom with ultimately which ultimately overshot into a bubble. Uh, the American dream of home ownership was pushed by new directives or, or suggestions to the Fannie Mae and Fannie, Freddie Mac. Um, six uh, financial innovations were also involved in this. Concessionary mortgage lending originated, originated the subprime assets. That was one, one problem. Then securitization of mortgages global the supply of mortgage finance. That was the Italian Ranieri's uh, invention in the 1980s, the securitization of mortgages. Then derivatives and leverage caught insurers napping. And credit default swaps proved that insurance was woefully underpriced. And mark-to-market accounting rules magnified the importance of not-so-relevant short-term fluctuations in long-term investment accounts. Variable rate mortgages made house equity a function of interest rates. Now, when the house prices peaked, the boom ended. When house prices fell below mortgage costs, homeowners walked away. The banks were left holding the bag, uniquely American. In Europe, you don't, if you borrow money on a mortgage and then the price of your house drops, you can't walk away from it. You still owe the money. You have to pay any difference. If there's a foreclosure and the, and the foreclosure gets less than the value of the mortgage, you owe the bank that difference. There. It's, that, that's a different thing here. Uh, and then uh, failing subprime mortgage assets created holes in balance sheets. Now, in the spring of 2007, Secretary Paulson said he had never seen the world economy in such fine shape. But there was a problem. The U.S. housing market had peaked in the second quarter. It turned down in 2007 and foreclosures piled up. Citibank Chairman, President and CEO Bill Rhodes wrote an article in March 2007, Financial Times, warning that the subprime mortgages could threaten the system as a whole. So he, he recognized this. Uh, of course, there were a, lot, so a few speculators that were ingenious, uh, ingeniously um, uh, bet against the housing market and bought up as many of these uh, insurances as they could and made, like, like John Paulson and, and others, um, made a lot of money on that. So anyway, that knowledge didn't help Citibank much. Citibank's still in trouble. IMF meetings in the spring of 07 decided that the system was robust enough to weather the storm. Well then, the crisis now is three parts to it. The subprime mortgage crisis crystallized on August 9th and 10th, 2007. I'll come to that in a minute. The September 15th bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, AIG, I could say also Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because they came a little earlier and were bailed out, and its aftermath. That was a separate thing. And then the economic contraction that occurred from 2008-3 to 2009-1. Now, you may think I'm jumping the gun here because the NBER hasn't decided yet where the where the, when the recession began and when it ended. They, they think it's, they keep revising it. But if you keep to the simplest definition of two successive quarters of negative growth, then it began in 2008-3. Now, um, um, yeah, so I want to point out, just emphasize, the second and third crises came a full year after the subprime mortgage bailout with, uh, by the central banks. In, the, <coughs> in this bailout, <coughs> sudden awareness of the bat balance sheet problem in the summer of 2007 had banks scrambling for cover. The scramble for liquidity was completely unprecedented since the days of the Great Depression, maybe even greater uh, than that, re even relatively. But the financial panic was averted by prompt official action. The uh, Federal Reserve, the uh, European Central Bank, the market opened six hours before New York, uh, issued, uh, said it would lend an unlimited amount at 4%. And there were 94.5 billion euros worth of takers. That's about $135 that 
that they put into of liquidity they put into the market. And then six hours later, the Fed came along, and uh, and other central banks came along, and they got together, and everybody contributed a bit. But I put down the European Central Bank and the Fed contributions to this liquidity crisis at this at this time. Now, in those two days of August 7th, $300 billion uh, of new money was issued by the central banks combined an unprecedented infusion of liquidity. Toxic assets remained on the balance sheet, but they could be worked off slowly. The infusion of central bank liquidity saved the day to a certain extent. Now, the Bear Stearns problem had, was that that was a problem in the summer of uh, 2007, and then it loomed up in a big way. Uh, that, but in 2007, they had to sell two subsidiaries they'd created that had specialized in these subprime mortgage assets. And um, they had, they, they were, that was a direct bankruptcy, but it was in, in March 2008, it became, Bear Stearns became insolvent, and then in May, J.P. Morgan took over Bear Stearns at a revised price of $10 a share. So that was in May. That issue seemed to be settled. It was the biggest, largest bailout, though, since long-term capital management in September 1998. Well, then comes the uh, fiasco, and I, which I bill this as the Fed's tight money blunder. In June 2008, the Fed listened to inflation hawks. They saw the huge balance sheet as a threat. The money multiplier uh, fell in half. Steve Hankey has uh, uh, has wrote about this in the in the in his Forbes uh, issue. Um, now, of course, tight money, tight money. How you can say how could there be tight money? Interest rates then were zero or half of one percent or one percent. How could that uh, low interest rates? But low interest rates don't don't tell the story about whether money is tight. Low interest rates is uh, you can have, um, in fact, uh, the uh, the um, uh, Switzerland, the Swiss bank, which always had a very tight monetary policy and strong euro, had not just zero interest rates; they had to have negative interest rates. They put a, a you had to pay a penalty to to get a deposit in Swiss banks because they were trying to discourage capital from coming in, and uh, low interest rates. It, Low interest rates come about typically because of the expectation of appreciation of a currency in the global. Japan has had low interest rates uh, for a decade, much two or three percent below because of the long run expectation that the yen is going to appreciate. You know, you look at the history of the yen, and you don't, when, when um, uh, MacArthur's um, uh, administrator, uh, the banker, uh, uh, David, uh, it was David Dodge. Dodge was the Detroit ba banker that apparently um, um, uh, uh, had, did the currency ten for one currency conversion in Japan in 1948-49 that uh, set to, and fixed the exchange rate at 360 yen to the dollar. And that was a duplicate, a duplicate of what that same man did in 1948 in Germany, a 10 for 1 currency exchange and fixing the Deutschmark to the dollar at 4.2 Deutschmarks to the dollar. That put them in the track to, to stability. But um, um, uh, the... Uh, so I'm, I'm, what I'm mentioning here is that uh, that low interest rates... Now, high interest rates, very high interest rates could result Nominal interest rates could will result from inflation. If you have high interest rates, it doesn't mean easy money. It means the, it can mean the expectations of inflation. Nominal interest rates there. So um, you have to have to look very carefully then to see whether um, whether interest rates are are high and whether high in real terms or not, and whether money is is loose or it's tight. Let's go on and see um, disinflation. The Fed acted. It achieved an unprecedented disinflation, as the following chart shows. I'll just put it here. Within half a year, it brought the inflation rate measured by the cost of living index, the change in that, down from 5.5% to 0%. Now, also, I make this little comment because I'm going to talk more about it. A long and variable lag in the effect of monetary policy? That was Friedman's. A basic idea, and and it was uh, uh, from six to eighteen months, and the Fed 
picked, has picked it up, and the Fed uses that. They think of a long and variable lag. And they, that's why when there's the beginnings of, in, of the expectation of inflation, people think you have to act on, to stop the inflation about two years, up to two years, before it's going to come about. Because if you wait until it's on your neck, it, 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 you won't be able to do it. It'll take, you'll have to suffer it for two years. But it's a very short term. Period. It's not. I think it's not two to sixteen months. It's two to no. I said two to no six to eighteen months. It's not that. It's six to eighteen minutes. Now, the, the long raid was six and eighteen months. And the Fed and many monitors seem to believe it. But Friedman's data was are largely taken from a world of fixed exchange rates. His work with monetary, uh, with uh, Anna Schwartz, covers most of the period, except for the 1870s, it covers the period of fixed exchange rates. Under fixed exchange rates, there's more truth to it. I don't, I'm not sure it's true, but there's more truth to it than there is under, under flexible rates. If flexible rates make a fundamental difference. But Friedman's data is taken from a world of fixed rates. Under flexible rates, the lag is between 6 and 18 minutes. Now, uh, in a world of fixed exchange rates, monetary policy in one country has to bring the whole world with it. If uh, one country decides to stop inflation, remember, inflation rates are connected all over the world. If you have fixed exchange rates, imagine a little. Imagine Hong Kong deciding it's got inflation. It's, it, it's deciding it's got too much inflation, so it's going to use monetary policy to stop the inflation. What it would have to do would be to tighten money, of course that would attract capital from over the world, but it would have to bring all world prices down because world prices and Hong Kong prices are going to be the same thing. You couldn't change it. So, so that's why it would, uh, under a long leg and a variable leg, because it depends on how many currencies are attached to, together in this. <clears throat> uh, disinflation under flexible rates is very different. A disinflation, when you're not connected together with the world, uh, it, it, and monetary policy is very effective because it works directly. It disinflates through the exchange rate. A country that puts, with, a, this is with capital movements, is exists in all countries, uh, tighten money, this appreciates the currency. And it's the appreciation that changes, that de decouples that country's price level from the others, the appreciation is what brings about the disinflation. Does it have a ring a bell? Uh, go, think back to the 1980s. When Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, the inflation rate in the United States was 13%. 13%. 11% in 1979, 13% in 1980, and 11% again in, 19, in, in 1981. Uh, in 1984, the inflation rate was 4%. Why? How, how could monetary policy operate that quickly to bring about in the biggest economy in the world uh, the, the price level, inflation rate coming down so quickly? It came about because the dollar doubled against the Deutschmark and all other, other currencies. And that was the mechanism of adjustment. Canada, in 1987, had a... Had a Governor of the Central Bank, um, uh, John Crow was his name. He worked at the IMF and others. He was the governor. But he had the original idea to do what Judy Shelton was t saying should be done, have a zero inflation rate. The, he said Canada should have a zero inflation rate. And he went around to the Basel meetings and he said, oh, you're, you're so bold. We, none of us would be, we're all, we're going to watch this very carefully to see what's going to happen. And uh, we're, 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 we're proud of you for doing this. So what Crow did was to, to tighten monetary policy. And uh, uh, the dollar, which was Canadian dollar, was at 73 cents. The Canadian dollar started to soar. And it went up uh, in the next, uh, um, uh, next three or four or five. This was 1987. The dollar went to 73, 75, 80, 85. It went up to 90 cents. A huge appreciation in about three years. And the inflation rate came down uh, 
below the U.S. inflation rate. The U.S. inflation rate then was about 3%. The Canadian inflation rate got down to 2%. We all said to, to, to Crow, you know, declare victory. Don't try to push it down anymore. But he, he kept trying to get down to the zero. And you see, in the, Canadians uh, always mix up. They get data, the American prices and Canadian price. They get, mix up the balance of payments. For a long time, when Ken had flexible rates in the 1950s, uh, they, they, they didn't know if the balance of payments figures were in American dollars or in Canadian dollars. So it was the, the, and, and to change, what, what you do, what you have to do if you get expectations, you have to change expectations fundamentally. For If the U.S. has a 4% inflation rate and Canada has a zero inflation rate, it means that the U interest rates in Canada have to be four percentage points below American interest rates. And it had never been like that in 100 years of history. And John Crow, of course, he was an Englishman. And he'd never lived in Canada 100 years ago, so he didn't, didn't, didn't have that experience with him. But it was, it was a disaster. So in 19, 1992, by the way, this was a, created tremendous, this tight money was creating recession, secessionist problems in, in um, Quebec uh, of, that aggravated to a tremendous extent. And then the final... Um, blow was the election of 1982 when the Conservative Party, which had a dominating majority in Parliament for two years under Mulroney, it ended up with two seats out of about, instead of 35, to, went, it was a complete demolition of the Conservative Party, and now there's no Conservative Party. Now it's called the Reform Party, which doesn't sound like a Conservative Party, but... But it is a conservative party. Well, I've used that, and I, I won't go into because I could talk about Brazil the, in 1999, the, the same issue. After uh, after this, you after a disinflation policy like this, you have to have a quick and dirty devaluation because the exchange rate is overvalued. And in 1984-85, that's what America did. America had the Plaza Accord. Uh, the Plaza Accord in September 22nd, 1985, uh, was designed to get the dollar down. The Deutsche Mark was uh, uh, like um, 3.5. The normal, uh, more normal level would be half that, 1.7. And uh, well, then gradually, uh, the uh, all kinds. The big, big main issue, of course, was to get the the uh, uh, yen uh, uh, up. It's called Japan bashing and big uh, attempts to get the yen to uh, to, uh, to go up. Now, um, uh, in the uh, in, what ha you know, of course you know the yen did go up at the time of the Plaza Accord. It was the dollar was 239 yen. Then the Japanese, with great difficulty, the next year broke the capital market. They, they, they sold bonds, the capital market started to go down, uh, and, and uh, interest rates come up, and uh, gradually they got the inflation rate, uh, or the uh, exchange rate down to um, uh, something like uh, 215. Uh, and then it got down to about 2, and it stalled there for quite some time. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, you couldn't stop it from going down, the dollar from going down, and the yen was soaring. Why did that happen? What was that suddenly, in, in, after 1986 to 1990, everybody wanted to get have Japanese things. The Nikkei went, went up to 44,000. 44,000. And that's the time people were saying that uh, you could... Uh, with the, uh, the emperor's garden, you could buy up all the land in Canada. With the money, uh, the land in, in Japan was worth all the land in the United States, a country 20 times the size geographically. So, so, so th now, so the disinflation is brought about through appreciation. And that's what, now, now, uh, now we have two great examples in the post-flexible period, the Volcker disinflation in the 1980s to 84, which uh, I call it the Volcker disinflation, but we doubled the dollar against the Deutsche Mark and brought inflation down from 13% to 
And then we have this current one, which I'm just coming back to now. Appreciating dollar and depreciating gold. And over back in the third quarter of 2008, it allowed the dollar to soar by 30% the price of gold and oil and other commodities to plummet. Not a bad thing to get the price of oil down. That's the one good part about it. But the dollar I appreciate by more than 25% against the euro and against gold and much more against oil. Oil plummeted from $148, uh, $148 to $35. Unprecedented 70% drop in the price of oil over that period. So this is the, the case for making that the Fed had tight money in here. Not the interest rates were stalled at 1% or so. The soaring dollar falling price of gold, collapsing oil price, inflation rate dropped from 5.5% to negative. It went down to, the inflation rate became negative in, uh, in January and February. And uh, that's when finally Bernanke, in March 2009, turned around and he said, we're going to, we're going to add, buy, we're going to uh, expand the money, our balance sheet, we're going to add $300 billion of government bonds to our balance sheet if we need to. Now, this is, this is the numbers on what happened to the, the dollar. The dollar went from uh, eight, uh, from 6.3, 63 cents to 80 cents. Euros per dollar was 160, 125, but it had been 164 in June. And then gold prounce fell from 980 to 720. There you see the, uh, the uh, red line is the Euro dollar exchange rate. This is the uh, dollar uh, going up, and then the blue line on the bottom going down is the uh, uh, is the uh, price of gold. And then this is the CPI uh, in index, uh, monthly annualized monthly rates. Look at this. This is this is what I'm. Look at that chart over that period, and you could just also the the further period when it went went to two percent negative. In this right. Uh, this is the um, best case to make a long and variable lag in the effect of monetary policy. How can how can you believe that? It's, it's very quick. And we're talking about we're talking six months over this whole period, and you have this astonishing reduction in that uh, inflation rate. So you don't need to to stop the inflation two months or two years ahead of time. Uh, you, uh, you, because you'll, you'll be able to stop it quickly when you need to, if it does. Now, I'm not saying that we should do it, but what a lot of people are saying that is that this uh, fall in the money multiplier, um, the money multiplier is Steve Hankey's Forb column, I mentioned that earlier, uh, fell from eight on the average to four. So what that, the threat that is for inflation is that if that re is restored to normal, there's going to be a lot of money liquidity out there. And... Uh, but is it going to be? How, how long can that come back up? It came down very quickly because the central banks could operate very quickly, but they could never operate. They could never disinflate anything like as quickly as they, as they did when they added this uh, central bank money. So Lehman failed because of the dollar appreciation in 2008-03. This was a mistake on the part of the Fed. The financial authorities decide not to save Lehman. This was bad judgment on the part of the Fed and the Treasury, and it was expensive to save Lehman, but far cheaper than letting it fail. Lehman's demise on September 15, 2008, was the biggest bank failure in world history. And we know that, actually, we know that uh, technically, uh, Lehman was in uh, uh, was bankrupt uh, um, at least a month earlier than that, and uh, and they tried to. to we know know also that. It was tried to be sold to uh, Lehman, to well, Buffett, Warren Buffett, uh, in uh, in February. Paulson met with Buffett and and the head of uh, of Lehman. But uh, um, in the, in the book of uh, in Paulson's book, he he implies, almost says that uh, the um, uh, the CEO of uh, Lehman, fold, fold, fold was um, charging too high a price, 
to Buffett. And then the Korean Development Bank was going to buy, uh, buy in this in the summer. Of, uh, and they were talking about it for a long period of time. But over this period, the appreciation of the dollar, what did it do to the real estate markets? It just sunk prices in real estate further, and it, it weakened even more all those bad subprime assets. And you had, not unconnected with this, you had in, um, in as early as November, you had uh, General Motors talking about going bankrupt. Now they're, they're no longer in the top 10 countries, the first time in 50, 80 years or so. They, they haven't been in the top 10 uh, in Fortune 500. So uh, uh, bankruptcy is all over, all over in the whole, whole system. So it was, you know, now Enron had been the biggest, but the Lehman failure was six times bigger than Lehman. Now, well, that's the point I'm making. These are, this is just a look at the big deficits and the counterparts of these. Every deficit, by Kuno's law, has to have a surplus, as a counterpart to it. The sum of all deficits in the world are zero, so you can... Now, China uh, is certainly a part of the uh, deficit counter... Uh, of the sur China's surplus is certainly a big part now of the deficit of the United States. But all through the 2000s, it was not a big part of it. It was below Japan and below um, the oil countries by far. And um, in, in, in the previous decade, the decade earlier in the 90s, China had almost a zero role in the deficit. So it's not something, today it's more important, but the arguments against China were being made when it wasn't a problem. Steve mentioned again the Dubai meeting. In, uh, I was in Dubai in 2003 at that time when the IMF was meeting and, and uh, they were, the conclusion of the meeting was to, uh, that, to get China to appreciate its currency. Of course, they say the Asian countries to appreciate. Uh, the IMF said the Asian countries to appreciate, but it, um, uh, but it meant China because they decided long ago that, that Japan's surplus was not a bad surplus to have. It was the intertemporal smoothing because of the age cycle in Japan. And this is, uh, I think, quite true. And uh, I think there's an argument you can make that that's true also for China, that the intertemporal arguments here. But I'm just saying here that the, the circle is not there. But if uh, China could have, uh, China could have, uh, if, if China invests abroad in the United States, $300 billion a year, buys treasury bills and other, or other assets, $300 billion a year, China is going to have a trade balance surplus, just as Japan has had a trade balance surplus um, since 1980, even before 1980. And uh, it's uh, had a, a chronic, uh, typically over $100 billion a year, and it still has today, even though the yen tripled against the, uh, uh, against the dollar over that period. The, think of these numbers, 1948, the dollar against the yen was uh, 360. At the time of the Plaza Accord, it was 239, let's say 240. At the, in April 19, 1995, just after the Mexican crisis, the dollar had got to a low point, an all-time low of 78 yen. So it's, a, it's tripled from 85 to 95 uh, against the dollar. And of course, it, it then created the, the, the Nikkei average is no longer 45. It just crashed the stock market. And uh, the stock market is now more like 10,000 or 12,000. And um, it, I was in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, one, in one time, I happened to look at the paper. And the paper announced, this is 2006 or 2007. The paper announced that for the first time since 1990, the housing price index had stopped falling and it leveled up. That was in commercial real estate. It, there was a 16-year uh, depression in, in, uh, in the real estate market over this because, of course, how can a currency uh, like, um, like any currency in Japan, how can you triple against a dollar? or even double against the dollar without causing enormous deflationary pressure. It may, the current exchange market doesn't, didn't do the right thing at all. When the, uh, the, the market was pushing up the, the yen in 1989, 1990, there were 10 books that came out saying Japan is going to take over the world. George Soros wrote one of them. He, he would say, 
Japan is going to take over the uh, world with with the, with the uh, all kinds of jokes were made about uh, um, uh, about in Australia and others about uh, what's the price of a beer? Twenty five yen. In Australia, the Japan would be taking over everything. Well, um, so I think this movement is all. Uh, but now I I want to. Um, this is the um, these are. This is um, the nominal GDPs of the U.S., Japan, Germany, and China. I didn't have uh, China's. Uh, yeah. Japan is just uh, is up up here. The second one down, and the last quarter, the um, Chinese um, output uh, GDP grew at 11.9 percent. So it's uh, really completely back on track, and so on. Um, but China is definitely coming up here. The red line is the Chinese. In total exports, China's exports are the greatest in the world now, greater than Germany's, and the U.S. is number three. Now, don't really believe this or take that too seriously because you count these things very differently. You count German exports, uh, Germany's part of the Eurozone now, but you count German exports to all the inside European countries. If you, if you wanted, if you were taking, trying to do California's trade, you would do, count California's trade with the rest of the United States and with the rest of the world. You see, so, so it, uh, it, 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 it's a bit of an exaggeration. And China's is a little bit strange too because a lot of the exports are re-exports. They, they're a processing country. They import a lot and they re-export. So it's not a, it's it, it very, um, uh, the, the Chinese like this very much to be number one in this, but it's a, they, they don't take it too seriously. Now, um, I, I don't know whether I should, I think I'm going beyond our time. I have done that too much. So um, I'll just say this. Uh, people have talked about the Greek crisis as a euro crisis, but would, if California went bankrupt, would that be a dollar problem, or would it be a California fiscal problem, or an, a U.S. government fiscal problem? That's the uh, point. I, I'm uh, sort of optimistic that in the long run that Greece will, um, uh, will get out of its... Uh, um, very difficult state, but it'll take a long run. What I've said, people ask me, is Greece going to default? And uh, I can't answer that question, yes or no. I could only answer it in terms of the percentage of my belief in the default. Uh, and I put that the possibility that Greece will default over the next five years at 40 percent, 60 percent that it won't default. So when I ask, answered a question to a newspaper reporter from Greece in the intermission here, I, I said, I don't believe Greece will default. 60% is, is, is the case. I didn't say the 60%. I just said, I don't believe it will default. Now, uh, I, I don't think there's anything more we can say about this. You, everybody knows that there has to be some something a little more dramatic than just a tightening of the growth and stability pact. You need to get some fiscal institution. Uh, and I don't think it's a good idea to have a European monetary fund uh, like the IMF. I think that's a bad idea um, because uh, uh, the, like the International Monetary Fund, uh, in 1944, this is a little diversion. At Bretton Woods, Keynes leaned across to either Harry Dexter White or to Henry Morgenthau, the table, and he said, why do you Americans keep calling the bank the fund and the fund the bank? The World Bank, you see, it was not a bank. The World Bank was a fund. And the International Monetary Fund is not a fund, it's a bank. It's, it, it, you see, but you you couldn't, use the term International Monetary Bank in the United States, or Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't have been elected, re-elected in 1944. That was, uh, that, that was, that's why the, the, uh, the, at, the, at Bretton Woods, uh, the uh, Americans, the white plan, the American plan, had um, uh, planned for a world currency in it. It was called UNITAS. 
And the, and the British plan had a plan for a world currency. It was called Bancor. But when the British came and said, well, wanted to bring up the issue of the world currency in earlier discussions, 1943-44, Robbins was saying this, wrote, Lord Robbins wrote about this. He said, um, the Americans always change the subject. They wouldn't, they wouldn't talk because it became a no-no to talk about the world, world currency. Now, I finally ended up on the, uh, uh, what I think, I didn't realize that, but I had put the title of the actually the International Monetary Order, and I didn't spend much time on that uh, subject. I, uh, I just want to say that, that the IMF was the first global monetary order that we can, that you could claim to be a really international one. Of course, you had in the Roman Empire uh, an order, and in other empires you had monetary orders. But the IMF was the first truly international monetary order. And uh, I think we need to go back to it, because I think the uh, IMF was set up to supervise a system of fixed exchange rates. And um, exchange, currencies should be substitutes. Every, the purpose of a currency is it's a unit of account and a medium of exchange and a store of value. It's got all these functions. And uh, the idea that you, you have, that the IMF picked up out of the Second Amendment to the IMF Articles of Agreement, the First Amendment created the SDR, the Special Drawing Rights. The Second Amendment in 1978 uh, established uh, uh, managed flexible exchange rates as the kind of order. But that's not what the way the IMF has interpreted it has been that every single one of the members of the uh, uh, IMF should have a separate currency so they can have flexible exchange rates. Now, of course, the number of... Uh, 16 countries now are in the uh, Eurozone, so um, there, the IMF now has fewer currencies than the number of members, but they've been trying to take all these little little small states, banana republics, some people call them, uh, that's not a very nice term for them, but in, in, that used to have absolutely fixed exchange rate systems, Cur quasi currency, something tighter even than currency boards, almost, almost like just the current, the, just it was just another name for the dollar with the currency automatic adjustment going, and the IMF um, I think played in that period of 1978 to 1990 a very poor role, and I think they were played a very poor role with the the transition countries because the best the reason you got monetary instability throughout the 1990s was that Russia had a 8,000% um, inflation over that period because there was no anchor country they could fix their currencies to. The dollar was not this, no longer had the magic anymore. We need to create, um, the, the, in 1944, the dollar system worked very well because, uh, pretty well, because the dollar, well, in 1945, it had 80% of world manufacturing. Now, that quickly got back down to more normal levels. But, um, but it's, the dominance of the dollar has gone down, and now that the euro has been created, the it's, it, it drove a spike a rivet between the um, core of the world economy, which has always been associated with the dollar area. Now there's another core. It's the the other core, uh, competing core is the euro area, and the only way you can move toward a monetary order now with uh, uh, based on fixed exchange rates, the only way is to stabilize the dollar-euro exchange rate. If you have wild fluctuations like we've had in the past between the dollar and the euro rate, uh, you, you cannot have a global monetary order. This wouldn't matter. You could invent, you could use the, you, whatever you did with the SDR, anything like that. It's just not going to work. You have to have the, that the dollar is no longer alone enough. The euro is even less. But together, they represent 40% of the world economy. And that would make, if you can stabilize that rate, it would also, they're all NATO countries, so that they, they, it would, uh, the stabilization would not be uh, opposed to a lot of the principles of establishing a, a currency area. Well, then this would, that, on that way, basis, then we could go on and create an, a wider, outside those two currencies, a wider SDR. We'd put China in the basket, because China should be in the basket at the next quinquennial review. China, I, my proposal was to give uh, China, like Japan and Britain, 
each 10% in the basket and the rest of the basket be shared between the United States and, uh, and, uh, and Europe. And that would be the new basket. And then you could use that SCR basket around uh, the, the anchor of the dollar-euro exchange rate and use that. Uh, these two countries, two big economies would be delegate, designated by the IMF to, uh, uh, to be that anchor and, uh, and then have a global money created on the basis of the SDR uh, that I call the INTOR, using the, the French word for gold in the last, after the international gold. But gold served a purpose for thousands of years as a money, and we, we're not going to necessarily go back and use gold again, but we can use the patina and reputation of gold and trade off that by putting it in the name for the global money. Thank you. Well, Robert, there, there was a lot in those remarks. Uh, my goodness sakes, it's going to take some digestion on that. We have, we have uh, run uh, a little longer than anticipated, which is fine when you have so much to talk about. But... Um, uh, I'll leave it up to a vote. Uh, shall we uh, break, or will you want to? You want to take a question? Is there one pressing, one major super question? Okay, by unanimous consent, we will have a we will have our our lunch outside. For those of you who wish to take a quick sandwich, uh, Professor Mundell will hold forth here for a little bit, and then we'll run upstairs for for uh, a lunch upstairs. Uh, how how does that work? Uh, all righty. I want you now to join me in thanking Robert Mundell for an extraordinary performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.